is kind of a key uh, uh, word. Uh, I'm, I'm very fond of quotes when, when, when I, I want to describe things. And I love this quote by, by Jonathan Watts, who's the Guardian's uh, global environment editor. Environment is not just another subject, it's a prism through which to see everything else. So when we talk about uh, sustainable journalism, it's, it's, as I see it, it's not, it's not about being, becoming some kind of activists, but it's, it's still being journalists and, and, and in, in a traditional way, but it is kind of taking on uh, new glasses and, and, and or with, a, with this prism where we see things differently because the world is changing uh, and we need to uh, um, understand how the world is changing. Uh, so, uh, we, as I said, we were a, a number of, of, of Swedish and, and African uh, researchers and, and journalists that took on the task of kind of looking at what is sustainable journalism and how could it be applied in a sub-Saharan sub Africa context. And, and uh, Dr. Theodora, she was a lead writer uh, of this uh, policy brief. And it was actually the first time that ever that this concept were kind of tried out in some kind of uh, reality. Uh, previously, the concept was kind of very academic and not really connected to, to reality. So, so this was kind of a pilot study that has, has been made. Uh, so so um, uh, thank you very much, Theodora, for, 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 for uh, taking the lead on, on that. Uh, well, as you hear, I'm, I'm trying to con uh, explain what sustainable journalism is about. And uh, I think we, we needs to be described from all kinds of different angles. This is, you know, the, 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 the two Swedish researchers, Peter Berglis and Ulrika Olauson, that, that kind of uh, came up, uh, that coined this concept. This is their uh, interpretation. And you can see that it's about our children and our grandchildren. How can we make sure that we produce journalism that meets the information needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs? So uh, it's very much uh, about, as anything with sustainability, looking at our, our children, our grandchildren, how can we leave uh, the world in hopefully in a better shape than we than it is today, um, and uh, uh, it's also about addressing two intertwined challenges of our time: uh, the sustainability crisis facing society, which is of course related to climate change, poverty inequality, gender inequality, and deteriorating democracies, and the sustainability crisis facing journalism, which stems from a drop in advertising revenue, fierce competition from the tech giants, uh, media capture, disinformation, and uh, a lack of public trust in the media. So uh, within the, the Sustainable Journalists Partnership, we believe that these crises are intertwined. A sustainable society, environmentally, socially, and economically, requires journalism that addresses the sustainability challenges faced by society. And the future for journalism as a practice and business depends on its capability to do precisely that in order to stay relevant and financially viable. So based on this, logic, we see a need to expand the traditional role of journalism to entail what we call sustainable journalism, independent uh, journalism uh, that not only safeguards and protect, promotes democracy, but is also an, an enabler of uh, a sustainable society.
So it's, it's about expanding the traditional role of journalism. And of course, uh, it, it's, it's very much related to, to these three uh, international government document, uh, the, the Sustainable Development uh, Goals, the Paris Agreement, and, and now lately the, the COP26 Agreement. It's about holding people in power to account and make sure that they keep all the promises that uh, they have made, because otherwise, uh, uh, sustainability to sustain our civilization uh, will not be possible. So it's probably the greatest threat uh, humankind ever has, has uh, met. And I think personally that, that this decade that we are in now will be a decisive decade for mankind. So we need, we need to act now and we, we need to rethink now. Uh, Johan Rockström is a Swedish climate uh, uh, change scientist, kind of uh, the, the rock star of, of, of climate change, I call him. Uh, and he says this, there is no contradiction between profit and sustainability. And I think this is an interesting topic to discuss because I, I often experience there are kind of two different teams. One team that say, you know, that, that profit is, is bad and, and that we, we need to, to uh, totally uh, remake the system and it cannot be based on, on profit. And then we have another team with the Johan Rockström and others that say, well, well no, but we have to rely on, on um, uh, innovation. And uh, even though innovation, of course, is not enough, but innovation is necessary. And if, if um, companies make profit on that, that is not contradictory to, to, to sustainability. This can be discussed, and I hope that it's something that we will discuss during this uh, session. Another way of, of, of defining sustainable journalism, it's sustainable journalism contributes to improving the economic sustainability of journalism while improving journalism's contribution to a sustainable society. So you can see they're kind of both sides of the, the coin the society side, but we also need to make sure that, that journalism as a business uh, survives, as in, because if we have no financial independence, we cannot have editorial independence. That's an old truth that I think is still uh, valid today. Lance? Yeah. Would you start rounding off? I am about to do so, Nayo. Sorry for, for being a bit lengthy. <laughs> so the global forum, uh, the, the Sustainable Journalism Partnership is a global forum where journalists, media and sustainability research develop knowledge and practice based on the relation between journalism and sustainability in research, education as a business and in journalistic practice. Uh, there is a, a number, great number of people that have uh, uh, committed themselves to, to this uh, partnership that is still kind of, you know, in, in, in its infancy. And if you're interested in this concept, interested in joining me, please connect with me. And, uh, and uh, I, I'd be happy to, to include you in this um, partnership. So, Dayo, uh, listening to you, uh, I will wrap up. And I, I think that um, leaving the floor now to, to Dr. Theodora, I think that there are two concepts that I want to, to leave uh, based on the, uh, you know, this little introduction. And that's gender transformation that I think most of you are aware of. But I'm also thinking, could, could you think of something that is gender sustainable that is called gender sustainability. If we talk about sustainability of something, uh, of the ability of something good to exist uh, constantly, uh, it's just um, a, a question that I'm uh, throwing out. So uh, uh, thank you for listening uh, and, and Dayo, over to you and to you, Theodora. 
Thank you very much, Lars. Um, quite interesting. Um, from the definition of sustainability as the ability to exist constantly. And also, um, Lars has thrown um, out a broad perspective about the new concept of, of sustainable journalism. <laughs> Um, as it re relates to, you know, uh, the crisis in journalism and the crisis in the world in which we live and the responsibility of journalism to deal with those crises as it deals with the crisis within. Thank you very much. Um, I'm doing a lot to save time. And so I will immediately call on, we'll come back to dealing with um, some of the issues raised by um, Lars and trying to ground it, ground them rather practically um, in our journalism that we practice in our newsrooms and see how um, sustainably practical these issues can be. Um, so I'll call on Dr. Theodora now to, I will give um, Theodora, quite some time to talk about, you know, in the long term, how do we have a sustainable gender sensitive newsroom in Africa? Theodora, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dayo. Thank you very much. And um, I must say that. Uh, Apart from being in Rose University, I'm also at the University of Ghana. Until about two months ago, I was at the University of Professional Studies, Accra in Ghana, but I am at the moment with the University of Ghana and Rose University. So Lars has given us the overview of the um, sustainable journalism concept. And we were drawn into this particular project through the License to Talk project that we are currently um, undertaking. And I don't want to talk too much about the License to Talk project and even the Sustainable Journalism Report because Lars has already given us some overview. So um, broadly, Lars tells us that sustainable journalism tries to interlink all the sustainability dimensions of society and that of journalism. So the social, the economic, and the environmental. When we talk about the social, social sustainability, gender is very, very important in there. So we are going to look at the, at the SDG five because in practicing sustainable journalism, we are looking at the SDGs and how uh, we are doing with those SDGs and bringing attention to issues that need to be addressed. And then we'll look at why we must be uh, interested in this particular um, SDG, which is gender. And then we'll, I want us to do sort of a reflective, a self-assessment of how the media is doing when it comes to gender. So we are looking at media uh, content, um, yeah, media content or media production of, of um, news and um, programming. And then we'll also look at um, media, you know, how gender plays out in newsroom cultures. And then we'll look at some ideal examples or some very good examples, and then we'll get into our interventions or the way forward. So the SDG five tells us that, or gives us um, the aim of achieving um, gender equality and empowering all women and girls. And we know why women and girls are the center of attention. It is because women and girls have largely been discriminated against or have suffered um, when it comes to social issues. And that there is a need to, you know, um, bring them at par with um, the men or and the boys. So in this SDG five, there are um, nine targets and 14 indicators. The targets are um, out, outcome, six of them are outcome um, oriented targets, and then three of them are the means to achieving those targets. And then when it comes to the outcome um, oriented targets, as you see there on your screen, you see that um, there is an aim to end all forms of discrimination against women and girls everywhere, including Africa, ending violence and exploitation of women and girls, 
And then we also have increasing value of unpaid care and promoting shared domestic responsibilities, ensuring full participation of women in leadership and decision-making, including leadership and decision-making in news organizations and newsrooms. And then we want to also ensure access to universal reproductive health and, and rights. But in order to achieve these, we want to foster equal rights to economic resources and property ownership and financial services for women. And then so when it comes to property ownership and even financial services, we are looking at ownership of media organizations and then promoting empowerment of women through technology. And in the use of technology, how are you know, women being projected and girls being projected and how are women using these technologies to enhance the image of women? And then adopting strengthening policies and enforcing legislation for gender equality, including gender equality legislations and policies on gender equality in newsrooms, which is very, very important to us. And apart from the global goals, which are... Okay. So apart from the global goals, in Africa, we have the Agenda 2063, which uh, basically uh, we, we have the slogan being the Africa we want. The Africa we want includes the Africa that has, you know, that has gender equality and um, that has achieved, you know, sustainable development and youth empowerment. And we believe that the media has a critical role to play in, in this because um, the media as we all know, has an advocacy role to play. They also have a role to empowering women, giving voice to, to women and girls and you know, the voiceless and all of that. Gender equality is very fundamental to development. And it is important that women, both men and women, participate equally in society and in the economy, especially in the economy. And according to the McKinsey Power Parity Report, Africa's gender parity stands at 0.58. And this is nothing that we can, we, we, we have to be proud of. And it says that for the continent to achieve full parity could be 140 years without drastic action. Indeed, we need drastic action. And that is why we are talking about this now. In fact, one of the greatest threats to Africa's future, according to the Global Partnership for Education is um, gender inequality. And um, that particular report actually tells us that women are responsible for 60% of work done globally, yet they earn just 10% income and 1% property. And in Africa, about, and this is the global, those statistics are for the global. But for Africa, about 70% of women are, are excluded financially. And the continent has 42 billion financial uh, financing gap between men and women. And this is something that we should be concerned about. We need that drastic action because without drastic action, we would have failed a generation and a generation to come in attaining these SDGs and the Africa that we want. And as um, Lars mentioned, we are looking at our actions in the present and the impact of those actions for future generations. And because we want the future or generations coming after us to have a better environment to thrive in both economic, economically, you know, environmentally and, and socially, we want our actions to, to be positive. We want to solve our problems that confront us now so that when it gets to their time, they will solve their own challenges and not the, the ones that we have passed on to them. So the news media, in fact, the GMMP, that's a global media monitoring project just last year, um, reported that news media may take about 67 years to close the gender gap. In 2015, they reported that it was 72 years. Yes, the gap is probably being narrowed, but there is a lot that needs to be done to close the, the 67 year old you know, gap that we have ahead of us. We don't want to wait till that time. 
And generally, when it comes to economics or the economic, and remember sustainable journalism has to do with the economic, the social and the environmental. So when it comes to the economic you know, uh, productivity or economic dimension of sustainable journalism or the sustainability of society, women lack access to credit and financial control. And this was actually um, um, something that last two years ago when at the um, Global Gender Summit um, was, came out you know, strongly and was discussed extensively. Some of the gender relation, related issues African countries have to contend with, apart from the economic, is um, of course, when it comes to the economy, it means that we need to scale up you know, access to finance and credit for women. We need to um, also create an environment for women to thrive when they, are, they start their businesses. We also have to pay attention to ensuring women's participation and voice. And we will see very soon that in news media over the years, the, we haven't been able to close that gap as expected of us. And then it's also important to break the glass ceiling. And it has also been advocated that it is not just the glass ceiling, it's the cement ceiling for African women's leadership. That is on the political you know, level, which is a social aspect. The media, it is important the media does um, helps in ensuring this because the media, as I mentioned earlier, has um, is one of the power that is a powerful and pervasive uh, influence on how we see gender, how uh, we, uh, it influences society on how to construct gender roles. And we see that largely gender roles is a social construct. So we construct it in ways that are discriminatory for, for women. And there is also the phenomenon of gender-based abuse, which media organizations need to shed light on and play an advocacy role to ensure that people are minded not to you know, um, perpetrate such on, on women. The, um, it is important that the media helps um, young people, young women, and even the elderly with information that can help them make very informed decisions about the environment. Because as uh, you see, you saw in Lars's presentation that the environment sets more than anything else, the framework for us to thrive economically and even socially. So let's look inside, you know, sorry, let's look inside media organizations and look at the empirical evidence for media ownership and management when it comes to empowerment and in leadership. Um, the Reporters Without Borders in 2017, uh, Media Ownership uh, Monitor found that ownership is male dominated. And in fact, this particular um, study was conducted in Ghana. Out of 25 companies that um, were surveyed, um, only two had female owners. And one company actually listed the majority shareholder as a woman. Two of the women are the wives of majority uh, shareholders of the respective companies. So the, we need, there's a question mark there. And then women also seldom hold management positions. And in this particular study, uh, out of 21 identifiable CEOs that were, were realized, only three were female. When it comes to the board, it was similar, um, less female representation on, on boards of you know, media organizations. Then there is the Alliance for Media, um, for Women in the Media Africa Report, uh, which is based in Ghana. Um, last year, they found that few women hold top managerial positions. So it confirmed uh, even the 2017 study that was conducted by the um, media reporters without borders. In Nigeria, and I specifically picked Nigeria because I know uh, there are quite a number of participants from Nigeria. In 2019, 2018, there were studies that found that there is discrimination from new sources and colleagues at work. There was sexual harassment, which is also pervasive in many African countries, including where I come from, Ghana, and, and so on. And then there is also the family roles, which impacts you know, abilities and um, the growth of women in, the, in their careers when it comes to journalism. And then discouragements from family members because of you know, the 
the sort of um, perception that it is women who have to play the caring role, the motherly motherly roles, and so on. So, um, because of the shadows of journalists, a lot of journalists, you know, had were discouraged by their family members to you know look for a more favorable you know career for for themselves that can help them take care of their social responsibilities, and then. Often we we see it a lot emerging in various studies that women are restricted to anchoring less challenging programs compared to male counter their male counterparts in the industry, and so, sometimes it is not just the women shying away from from those roles, but the the structures in news organizations make it such that um, the men do the hard news, uh, the, the women do the soft you know, kind of content or soft news or programming. And then last year's Reuters Institute um, Women in, in Leadership in News Media report um, found that in about 10 countries that were surveyed, including South Africa, um, Hong Kong and the rest, 23% of the top editors across the 200 news outlets were, were, were women, even in um, places where 40% of journalists in, in the markets were, were women. So generally 40% of journalists were women, but when it came to you know, managerial or editorial positions, um, they, were, they were just 23%. And every single market that covered um, had a majority of men being top ed editors, almost all, the, all of them. There is an exception, a section, which is one that we should be proud of, and I'll talk about it. Uh, so in countries like Brazil, Finland, uh, where women outnumber men among working journalists, even in those, you know, in, in, in those economies, we realize that they, they realize that uh, there were less uh, women holding top uh, editorial positions. In Japan, none of the major. Could, 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 I think somebody needs to. Hello there, how are you? So, if you have. As your brother started the program. Okay, thank you. So, in Japan, none of the major news outlets in their sample had women as, as, as top editors. And of course, AWIM has conducted a number of studies, including one that was um, conduct, uh, done in um, Rwanda and then across some Sub-Saharan African countries. And they found that sexual harassment um, was pervasive, poor salaries, sometimes even um, discrimination when it comes to salaries for journalists and editors who both male and female holding same positions and male getting more pay than the, the, the women. And then there is also gendered roles in the workplace like um, I mentioned earlier, um, cyberbullying in the line of duty and women suffer that more than men, including sexist comments, you know. In Ghana, another study was conducted by um, Alliance for Women in the Media and they found a mixed picture of progress and stagnation for women in journalism. And as we see today, we have on the panel Jifa and then Odilia. These are some of the women that are, you know, progressing and are um, making us happy about what is happening. But there are a chunk of women who are just stagnating. And so um, we they also found that um, women were more likely to assign soft news and social beats than men. So similar to other studies, harassment also was the same case. Let, let me just point out that the, uh, when you see on your right, um, the Pointer Institute reported last year, uh, this year, that women dominate journalism schools in the US, but newsrooms are still a different story. And they found that even though more women were getting out of journalism schools, when you go into the newsroom, there were less women re represented there. So the questions that we can ask is, are uh, news organizations not hiring women? And if that is the case, why? Or are these women going, um, getting out of journalism schools and going into other professions? And what could be the reason? I'm sure some of us may know the reason. So the media uh, monitoring Africa, they also found similar things. I think I would not go through these um, often, uh, uh, yeah, but there's a point that the fourth bullet 
um, which was um, a, a, something that was carried out, I think a study that was carried out by Bird in South Africa said that, uh, found that whenever the media became the subject of issues of sexual harassment and discrimination, they tend to be less open and transparent. So they are able to shed you know, great light on the, the sexual harassment and those um, gender-based violence happening outside newsrooms. But when it came to their own issues, they were not as loud as, as, as such. And that is something that really we should be worried about. When it comes to programming and hosting of uh, especially um, um, top programs like the morning shows, which is you know, very much listened to in a lot of countries, especially in Ghana, a lot of people listen to the morning shows. And when you, those pictures you see on the left are some of the images from some newsrooms and, and their morning shows. And you would see that uh, for the first picture, the, the panel is all men. For the second, that the one below it, you would see that there is a woman in there, but that woman is somehow part of the morning show, but not uh, a, a, someone who comes in there to you know, engage in discussions, but just does, does the um, newspaper review and then goes. The host is, a, a, is male. Same with other ones. And you will see that all the women you see there are just doing the newspaper review. And after that, the men coming to, to, you know, to do you know, the, the, the main issue, things. So there is, we need, uh, where women are you know, represented on even these new, uh, this, these programs, which are well, uh, you know, listened to a great deal. It is more of a tokenism. So you come and support us and sort of. And the male experts are outnumbered. And this particular study was conducted this year in Ghana, that male experts outnumber five, uh, female experts more than 10 to one you know, when it comes to leading radio and, and television news programming. But as I said, okay. there are some good examples. Sorry. 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 You should start to round off now. Thank you. Yes. There are some good examples. In South Africa, um, the Reuters Institute um, study found that 47% of top editors are, are actually fem uh, female. And um, you, so that picture you see there is an editor of the Sowetan, which is one of the most circulated daily newspapers in South Africa. We, we saw our keynote yesterday's keynote, for instance, also is uh, the editor in chief of SABC and then other women who are making waves here. And these are all top. And of course, there are some good examples in Nigeria, Ghana, and so on. And then, so let me just talk about COVID and women. When it came to COVID, when COVID broke out and they were looking for experts to talk to, studies show that few women experts were quoted. Where women were even, you know, um, um, represented, they were drowned out by, you know, three, four, five men. So one woman and then maybe five experts. And it's because sometimes we assume that um, there aren't female experts, you know, to, to speak to the issues. Sometimes it is, so it's basically stereotyping, which is something that we don't want to see. Among persons read or seen in the media, 24% are women, just 24%. And that's not reflective of the society. And this is GMMP's um, 2015 report. When it comes to sports coverage of women, women are presented as, you know, sort of um, men in uh, female bodies. And even sports, sports events related to women are not given that prominence as you would find um, that which is given to, to the men. Females, when it comes to interviews, uh, after they are like um, Osaka, Naomi, Naomi Osaka and um, the, the rest, Serena Williams and all those people, they have been pestered. They have been asked uncomfortable questions. And one question that was asked um, Serena, um, Williams is about, I think 2018 was that, um, whether she was intimidated by the looks of Maria Shaprova, which is something that you would never ask a, a, a man. And it's very, very embarrassing. It doesn't speak to their abilities or why they are even in the limelight. When it comes to digital media, these norms exist. So when digital media, you know, 
became something that's a boom, sort of. We all thought that women were, were going to use those platforms to um, you know, um, rewrite you know, all the images that we have seen. But even when we contribute content, we see we are still contributing the soft content. So we are looking at fashion, food, and, and all of that. We are, not, we are not doing the business, we are not doing the finance, politics, uh, as we, would, we, we thought we would. But sustainable journalism, um, want us to look at things in, in a different way. We want development that balances the social, economic, and environmental sustainability. So we are looking at the triple bottom line. We want an integrated approach where newsrooms would look at their own practices and how it reflects on society and also shedding light on societal problems. We want a systemic uh, you know, approach to solving societal problems. And when it comes to gender sense, we want gender sensitivity in the day-to-day -day behaviors of news um, journalists, news organizations, and so on. Gender sensitivity in, in coverage and programming. But in order for us to do this, we need to understand why the norms exist. And it has been found that women sometimes feel inadequate, inadequate enough to comment on issues. Sometimes they want to seek permission before they do that. Men ordinarily do not do that. Women shy away from, from media. And then sometimes there is the, norm, the, the, the syndrome of I don't have time. And many a time, people have said that it is easier to access a man than get a woman as source for anything. It can be programming. The stories from the Wanifra, you know, Women in the News Project is very interesting. And that is something that journalists and anyone interested in the health of media has to uh, go and listen to, especially when it comes to gender. Um, they interviewed a number of top editors in various countries, from various countries. And we found when, when you listen carefully, you realize that there is a lot of support for these women, for them to be able to rise to that level, because it's a, the men in the newsrooms understand, you know, the women's roles, the additional roles women have to play in society and support them. Other women also come in to support them. There are cases of other women rather not supporting anyway, but other women also support these men, uh, these women, for them to you know, rise to that the level that they find themselves now. And one particular um, journalist from Norway talks about the, uh, the, her superiors believing in her abilities. They couldn't have believed in her abilities if she had not shown those abilities, right? But they believed in those abilities and they pushed her. And I'm sure that when we get to Jifa and um, Odilia, they will tell us about some of these issues on, on a daily basis, what they encounter in, in newsrooms. And then, one particular editor from Kenya talks about how a lot of her colleagues had to bow out of the profession because they did not receive the support uh, or from even family and other, other uh, issues as well. But we want women to be in leadership positions in newsrooms. And the few women that get there, we want them to advocate for other women. We want them to give them support we want them to ensure that content you know, reflects gender equality and then uh, giving voice to women, children, or, or girls. And then um, looking at the issues that come from the social, economic, and then especially the social and economic sustainability of women and drawing attention to these. We want them to be a little accommodating we, uh, because we are hoping that they will, because they understand the, uh, they, they are women and they will understand their colleague women. And then we also want them, uh, it has been found that when women are in editorial positions or management positions, they are usually loyal. And so we want women, more women to be hired. But once, once they are there also, they should advocate for other women. We want um, um, women who find themselves in uh, management positions to advocate for the voices of women to, to be heard. There are many interventions. The studies that are being conducted are very useful because they shed light on the situation as we find ourselves. And once we know uh, um, the, the, the trend, then we can find solutions to them. But one of the key solutions when it comes to getting women's voices to be heard 
is um, the directory of female news sources, which a number of countries have. So in Zimbabwe, there is one where journalists can fall, which are, yeah, provides the opportunity for journalists to, to look out for women's sources from various fields. In South Africa, there is the Call This Woman, which is very, very useful. And I came across them when I was doing a particular research and they compiled a number of, you know, um, experts in various fields from archaeology to, to zoology. And um, they compiled these people. And when it came to COVID, the interesting thing was that in the early stages of the outbreak in South Africa, called this woman circulated eight, just at the beginning, eight COVID related media experts or experts who can sp speak to the media. Within a week, these lists had been consulted and uh, you know, uh, uh, used. They updated it. And by, um, I think halfway through, they had been actually sourced 900 times, radio stations, television sta stations in the country and out of the country. So it is very, very useful uh, for journalists to do this. And of course, um, researchers, academics also can collaborate with these um, the, the, the journalists to do this. AWIM also has a source like that, the, um, which also has, you know, um, is a directory for um, journalists and journalists have to access these things and um, it is regularly updated. So you have there. And then the WANIFRA, their um, podcast is very, very useful for women and even male journalists to access. And there should also be sexual harassment policies. And some media um, development organizations like the ALMA has actually developed a guide for media organizations that can be used. So you, we, can, we, we can use that guide um, to you know, um, have policies for or sort of um, operationalize it to suit our various contexts um, to address issues of gender uh, um, discrimination and harassment and all that in the newsrooms. Gender must be on the agenda of news organizations. And we have to use these um, news, uh, the, or the sources, that is the, um, the source, the databases that we have available and regularly updated. But as journalists, when we go and talk to a woman, we also need to use the snowball approach to ask them whether they can connect us to other women. And Although women um, journalists cannot force women to, you know, um, to speak up or to use the media to advocate for the things that are important to us, we believe that um, journalists can go the extra mile to convince women on why it is important for their voices to be heard. So that is why it is important that in newsrooms we always have to sensitize male and female counterparts. That let us have this agenda at the back of our minds and let the women know why it is important for their voices to, to be heard. Because a lot of the time, women may not, some women may not know why it is important for their voices to be heard. We have to create that culture in the newsrooms to have a uh, newsroom to have a gender focus because you're looking at it in the long term perspective, remember. So it's not just an ad hoc or one off thing that we do, it should be a deliberate the gender sensitive and non-discriminatory uh, recruitment right from the recruitment processes through to uh, you know all that we do in the newsrooms ensuring that we get equal pay advocating 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 and of course women cannot do it alone it is important that men also come on board to to help us achieve this we should have clear promotion guidelines to avoid any kind of discrimination or against women when it comes to pay and then even progressing training opportunities should be given to women. There are cases of women being pregnant and because of that, they've been denied opportunities. Pregnancy should not be a reason a woman is denied an opportunity, a training opportunity, or a, a, any kind of you know, opportunity to develop themselves. So media, women in the media, like our, those on our panel and those here uh, in, in the audience should ensure that uh, because we understand ourselves, we need to also make room for flexible shadows for women to, you know, be able to combine all the roles that they have. Um, to and and in the Wanifra, women in the news, um, 
um, podcast project, we found we when you listen, you realize that uh, some of the women actually had were given flexible terms. There was actually an editor who nearly turned down an offer, but a male counterpart, you know, decided that don't worry, we'll give you a flexible. When can you come? So she was actually off twice a week. She was given two days off every week or three days or so, so that she can attend to other things. But of course, when we are given such opportunities, we also need to prove that even within those days that we have been given, we work uh, to, to, to prove why, to, to justify sort of our inclusion in court. And then there should be sexual harassment committees apart from the policies to ensure that um, perpetrators are dealt with in, in a manner that would discourage other people from engaging in such, or other men from perpetrating such. Um, I keep uh, repeating some of the things because advocacy is very, very important and women in leadership positions in newsrooms must advocate for, for other women. We, those of us who find ourselves in, in, um, in uh, educative, you know, the education space would have to also, also all ensure that gender is very, very important because students, people learn from, from, from the classroom and then take those things that they learn into, into practice. So it's very important that we, we, we let gender become one of the things that we always talk about. It's not, it shouldn't be an elective course. It should be something that a core course that everybody takes. And then I'll, I'm rounding up, please. This is the last you really must stand up now. Yes, please. Yeah, I know so you the, just have a few slides. Okay, so the, I'll just end with one of the, uh, by saying that the media have a transformative role to play in achieving gender equality, and we know this, but it should be an agenda for us. If we, sh we don't see it as an agenda and in light of sustainable journalism, we are likely going to lose sight of that. But if you are going to practice sustainable journalism, then gender is one of the things definitely we are going to look at. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Theodora. The media does actually have a transformative role to play. Um, the data, when I saw um, Dr. Theodora's um, presentation earlier, I found very depressing the data um, she came up with. Uh, and she came up with so, so many depressing, <laughs> unfortunately, data. For, for, and they are the reality in our newsrooms. For example, that it will take 67 years for us to bridge that gap. That is incredible. So we do have a lot of work to do. I have a number of questions, but I wonder if we have... Um, so we will have a few minutes to discuss Lars and Theodora's um, presentations, but I just wonder, um, part of the problem of gender limitation in our newsrooms, and Theodora didn't just talk about the newsroom, journalism. If you talked about sustainability, looking at the economy, the society, and linking up to our journalism, and gender equality, gender parity, paid parity, and so, and so on. A few years ago, Walisho Inca Center in Nigeria, headed by Motorai Alaka, conducted some kind of survey research. And it opened our eyes to the fact that we need to do more in our newsrooms for women. Not just in terms of, I'm not talking about pay parity. The pay for everybody is, is terrible. <laughs> So don't let even go into that. But the fact that in many newsrooms, you would hardly find 10% of the population of reporters in the newsroom as women. Not only that, they also found, and that's why such conversations are terribly important, to point us, to point out those things that are missing in our newsrooms. For example, one of the things they found out also is that Journalists, even women journalists, are not making deliberate efforts in our reportage. The sources we talk to, the experts who provide background, expert perspectives, the economists, the doctors, the medical doctors, the psychologists, and so on, are mostly men. So you find up to 100 stories, and the people who are speaking in those stories 
are basically men. And so the question was, are there no women experts in Nigeria? But the default, the default attitude of journalists generally is, is just to go to men and so on. And partly perhaps because it's a male dominated world where managers, owners are all men. And so the question I have is, from the perspective that um, Lars and, um, and um, Theodora have provided, Lars talked about putting on new glasses and seeing things differently. Can our newsroom managers entitled, you know, newsroom managers, male dominated, can we even start to look at the issues from a, a, a broader perspective that our work not just impacts or must impact on the society, but future generations. Um, maybe I'd like um, 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 last to, to, to talk about that. Do you think it's in practice possible immediately? Lars. Uh, well, obviously, uh, uh, I mean, given the, the perspective of 67 years, uh, we can say that uh, that would be impossible because it's too late. I, I think that we have kind of a window now uh, that starting really one year ago or even further than that, I'd say 10 years, when we have to, to, to create a balance, both when it comes to, to, to uh, social sustainability, gender equality, uh, economy, and, and uh, environment. So, so uh, obviously uh, we need to act. And, and I, I really want to state again that, that we need to, to rethink, and I, as I said, we, I need to buy some new glasses. We all need new glasses to see the world as it is or as we want it to be. And I think that is what transformation is about and, and, and what Theodora uh, talked about, that we need to uh, transform not, not only the newsroom, but most of all, uh, our minds and the way we, we, we look at things. And um, I think... Uh, uh, it is really important that we all try to, to be as creative uh, as, as possible, not only to look at what is wrong. We know that this is, uh, this is very wrong, the system that we are in, uh, and, but, but we need to really find it jointly, try to find good solutions to, to, to the challenges that we are facing. And that is what I'm, I'm hoping that we will be able to do in the Sustainable Journalism Partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. I wonder if we have any questions from members of the audience or participants. Um, I will have to... Um, sorry, do we have questions from, it, 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 somebody says, Dr. Theodora, it is true the media should lead the way towards gender equality through gender sensitive and gender transformative content. I feel we also need our governments to develop policies, rules, mechanisms, and all that. Um, we need to work more on what are uh, the attitude of top, and that's what I just talked about. Um, Zifa says she's leaving. So there are no questions in the chat box, but I'd like, I'd like to ask the same questions. Now, um, Zifa and, um, Zifa and um, Odelia are managers in their newsrooms. And I wonder if, you want to share experiences about um, the gender situation in your newsrooms, particularly. So I actually have a question. I was talking to Dr. Akim Ovala yesterday, and this came up. And the question was, so um, in Theodora's presentation, she observed that mass, mass communication schools are filled with um, women, students, but it doesn't translate in many women in newsrooms. Why? 
And like you said, is it that the women go to school of communication and then they go into advertising or something else or go teach rather than come to journalism? Is there such a disincentive? So what barriers limit the number of women in newsrooms even when schools are dominated with women? Why is that difficult? Can I go first? Difa. Okay, Odelia, you can go first. Yes. So um, I handle the business department for my group. And uh, my observation is that usually um, women find this space quite difficult. So if you had challenges um, as a woman doing mathematics um, and doing um, STEM programs, then definitely you find that um, you won't find them in um, um, the business departments of, of the various media houses. Um, generally, the thinking is that it's difficult. Um, it is an area where you need to um, be so technical before you can actually um, have the numbers. Remember that in this department, um, it's made up of people from finance, economics. And so if you do not also have the numbers in the finance classrooms, then it's obvious that a, it won't translate into the numbers in the newsrooms as well. So deliberately what I am doing here is encouraging ladies um, to come and start off with the soft business aspect of things. And then as they continuously um, work within the system and continuously hear the terminologies and interact with their male counterparts who um, are coming from the finance background. They, it, it gradually grows on them. And then before they notice what seems to be impossible and scary is actually something that they gradually take control of <clears throat> gradually take control of and then um, gradually get to um, work within the space. Um, for example, there was a national service person joining our team and it was a real struggle um, whether she was going to survive in this space, is there something that she can do and all that. So I, I basically shared with her that we're going to do this in phases. You will start off with the soft business issues that does not require you to know um, the capital market or get to um, really know what happens within the stock exchange or what happens within the budget. Let's start off with the basic things that happen within the markets because they actually tell the real things that, you know, um, people actually use their monies for. And so if you go to the market, um, that's where the real action is, whether the budget is implemented or whether people buy stocks and all that, everybody goes to the market. So let's start from there. Once you have a hold on that, then you can really connect and relate to the, the real issues. So that's how we're dealing with uh, some of these things within our space. But yes, indeed, it's difficult and no. you do not find women. Well, so um, am I mute? Okay, so um, Odelia, you're, you're talking about a specialized area of journalism business. So perhaps even it's not understandable, it's not acceptable, but let's even um, leave it at that. But for we're talking generally about newsrooms. In my newsroom, for example, by the way, we have two editors in my organization. One of them is a lady. Um, the editor of our fact check hub. I think the thing to do is like um, Motorio says, is that mm -hmm. newsroom managers and newsroom owners need to be intentional in ensuring that more women are brought in. And that's what we have done in the ICIR. As a matter of deliberate policy, we look out to employ women. And not just for soft, um, you know, the traditional, um, 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 unfortunately, the traditional um, beats that they want to put women on, life, education, and all that. No. The ICR, for example, is an investigative, um, and so the women will go anywhere. So, um, Diva, I put the same, questions, um, the same question to you now. She's talked about the situation in a a business environment, journalism environment. What about your, new, your newsroom? 
generally, we're talking about the inequality, the inability of women to, 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 to operate in newsrooms and rise to positions of authority or, or, or management. Why is that so? Difa, you have to unmute yourself. Is that for me, Difa? Yeah, I can't the question is addressing me. Your internet is not working. Okay, because I, I Sorry, didn't hear um, many people. So can you hear me now? Okay, so yeah, we can hear you now. So go ahead. Okay. So I, I think there are a number of things. Um, I don't exactly agree that it's more difficult to get women into the newsroom. Because if I look at even the statistics of the time I was recruited, I came in with 12 other people and both men and women. And when I check, they are only of starting this job. I didn't start off as a news journalist. I started as a radio DJ playing music. So for me, I feel that challenge is what women in particular want to do. A lot of women are enrolled by what they see young women get when they come into the insurance. It's a shock culture that what you see on TV or what you hear on the radio is just 5% of the work. All the other work is leg work, hard work, written work. It's a lot of reading. It's a lot of critical thinking it becomes too hard for many of them. And so it is easier to fashion and the like. So if we want to have more women pursuing these critical areas of journalism, we need to obviously keep recruiting and keep encouraging. But the truth is it's a very, very difficult job. It requires so much preparation, so much reading, so much engagement. And it's too time consuming. And I think it's the main reason why many people, even many men, do leave uh, the, the environment. I think more men stay because it's an opportunity for them to peddle influence. For a lot of women, they leave because it's just not worth the remuneration. And so the time comes, not enough money is good enough to pay for your free time. So that's one aspect. So I think there must be a conscious effort to identify talent, critical talent, not just beautiful women to come and work in a newsroom. Because I think sometimes the view is, oh, we need an anchor. And they are only looking at how pretty she looks. They are not critically questioning um, what, what do you read? You know, what are your, your interests? Uh, what are the areas of you know, uh, reporting that you would like to do? I did security reporting. In fact, when I worked at Multimedia, where Odelia works, I was the first head of security reporting. Anything police, you get it from me. Anything conflict, you get it from me. And that's really just because maybe a bit of the Nigerian spirit that I, I had growing up in Nigeria, I'm a go-getter. I want to be successful. But the question is, no, how many no. of our young women are like that? How many of them are like that? So that's one. The second bit is, yes, we must be deliberate. Many, when I worked at the state broadcaster, it was training that I received. And it has helped me along the way. And it allows you to try and groom young ladies to help them through what are some of the challenging times. Unfortunately, Lifa's internet, or is it my internet? Can you guys hear me? No, we can hear you clearly. Lifa's um, internet. I can hear you. Yes, so yes, Difa, I think true. your internet is um, bad, but you've answered the question. So I actually wanted to ask you a, a follow-up question because 
from what you said, it, it then means that perhaps some of the fault is with women who don't find um, journalism and the workload comfortable. And could that also be because of the nature of, in Africa, the women have so many responsibilities in the house and juggling work, family, children, and all that could also be. So does it mean that, um, so um, Odelia, I'll come to you because I see you shaking your head. You probably have an experience to share. So does it mean that journalism is not, and that probably might be one of the big reasons that journalism is not um, co uh, conducive for women to, uh, um, as a professional, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination of many things and um, I can really connect with what um, you're saying and connect with what Jifa is saying in relation to people wanting to really break their back to do the work. Um, I have a personal experience and in 2016, when I had my first child, I had to go off for like a year and a half um, because I just couldn't combine. It was my first child. Um, and then it was also work. Um, after three months, I had to come back to work. And then I didn't have the support systems um, to hand over this child to. And so I had to quickly veer off into private practice um, to do some comms and PR services for people. Because if I, though I was then working within a system, um, asking even for extra time without pay um, was a challenge. And I definitely had to hold on and say that, hey, let me finish dealing with this, my child, raise her up to a certain point where I feel very comfortable leaving her within a school system, and then I can come back to work. And that's what I did. And so about one and a half years when I had delivered, I, I stayed back um, just to make sure that I have my, my back is really solid to be able to um, have that peace of mind to leave the child in school and then come to work um, with that piece of mind. So yes, that is really like a big challenge for um, um, women. And of course, even when you get to the managerial um, level, if you haven't actually um, finished, for example, um, having children, it's always a um, two things that you always have to think about. And then, well, so if you decide to go having children one and a half years or even about two years of your life and then your managerial position, which you don't find too many women in the space, how are you going to be managing that and managing your 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 family life as well so those are our our real realities and um, um so for example i know in uh, there are a couple of companies in ghana who have um um daycare centers where you can keep your children and then whilst you are working your children are within your workspace i think that if that is for example they are not media houses they are banks and then um, Unilever, and then um, an investment bank. Now, if we have stuff like that working, for example, in media houses, I think it will help us a lot um, so that women can dream of even becoming managers, knowing that when they have these kinds of support systems in the um, working space, they can continuously work and have the peace of mind. But if they know that it's that rigorous and at the management level, it's also still very rigorous, then you see them falling out uh, off after several of them go to have children they don't come back i see you want thank to you very something. much Th thank you very much odelia I, I i wonder if um participants have a uh, have questions for our panelists um before we go to odelia to hear her perspective about sustainable uh, media sustainability but i have All right, Mr. Um, Jay Agum Oh, sorry. So um, we have some questions in the chat. Okay. Okay. Would you want you want to read them out? Okay. Yeah. So there's this one by Julie in the chat. She says, "I also have concern about women who are saying higher positions." Now, this is based on what some women journalists shared with me recently. They do not give support to women to women reporters in the lower ranks ranks. What do you say about this and how do we concretely address this aspect? 
As a matter of fact, that is the question I have, and I'd like Difa to, to answer, because um, Theodora said that it's terribly important for women in positions to also be advocates for women, um, um, equality, in the newsroom, and even al al along the SDG lines, um, uh, and so on. And so this person is saying that, as a matter of fact, women in the in positions of authority don't have the back of the junior ones. Why is that so? You have become manager and you don't care about others? So Daya, that's a, a difficult question to answer because I've experienced similar where there was a senior editor who was a woman and I don't think she provided the support. On the contrary, I felt she was a tyrant. But the reality also is that both men and women, like I've said, need gender sensitivity training so that when they get into leadership, they can look at the perspectives in a clearer way. The fact that someone is a woman and she's a leader doesn't mean she's gender sensitive. In fact, she probably wants to be the only shining star. And so she will not give space to the younger female reporters who could very well become her competition could become uh, younger and better than her, and she may be edged out. But what I also believe is that uh, individual women who are working in these newsrooms also need to demonstrate value. You must demonstrate your contribution. You must demonstrate that you can be relied upon. So the job is hard. Unfortunately, it's a business. And unfortunately, the business circulates around certain timelines. It also circulates around certain audience share timelines. And so if the audience share is heavy between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., if you want to be noticed, if you want to be seen, you have to find a way to get into that space. I am one of two or I would say three other hosts who host a Saturday news analysis show on TV in Ghana. For a long time, as of two years ago, it was all men hosting these news analysis shows on Saturday mornings from 9 a.m. till midday. I chose to do it against my better judgment because I knew that I had the capacity but I knew it was gonna be a sacrifice. It means I can't take my children swimming. I can't take them shopping. I can't take them to a party. I can't even cook on Saturday between, uh, um, you know, up till 12, because I get to work at 5.30 in the morning. My show starts at 7 a.m. and I'm done at 10.30. I still have to work and produce news for midday before I can probably plan for the rest of the day and exit at two. So unfortunately, it is what it is. So if you know you're in this job, you then make a deliberate choice in a husband if you choose to marry, such that this individual supports you and appreciates the dynamics. Yes, and I had to do that. There were people that I knew that if I were to make a commitment to them, it wouldn't work for me. So I chose not to. So this person has been with me for 25 years since I started this job at age 19 and has seen what it has become. And so the reality is that we want women to come in, but they must be able to sacrifice us as, as well. Because at the end of the day, it's a business. If the business is owned by a woman, probably things would differ. Maybe if there were laws that deliberately insisted that there were these gender policies in media houses, maybe things will be different. But for now, they are not. So we have to, to grind through. But then as leaders, we try and make concessions. So I'll give an example. A woman comes to do um, a, a show on Saturday morning. She hosts a family show at 6 a.m. on Saturday mornings. I give her a concession of having Fridays off so that she can have Friday off to come in at dawn to do the show on Saturday, you know? So those are some of the concessions you make. In my previous life, years ago, I had hosted that particular show on a different station. I worked from Monday to Friday and still woke up at 4 a.m. to get to the station at six to do the shows. But I'm older, I'm a manager, I know better. 
So I tell this person, have Friday off, but please make sure you do this show on Saturday and do it well. So there are concessions that can be made to help keep women in the business. I just want to say one more thing about costs. It's very costly for women to be in this environment because you have to look good, dress properly and the like. Truth be told, women should be paid more because of these things. A woman who is coming on television, a woman who is making appearances, she has to buy clothes, she has to do her hair, she has to look presentable. These additional costs are never factored in to her salary. And I think those are things that as leaders, if they are women, you can make some change in that regard. Where I work, the CEO is a woman and she appreciates the need for that. And in fact, how a woman looks on television is so important to her, it is part of your allowance. Uh, it's not much, mm -hmm. but at least it's, it's a first step. So at the end of the day, let's take into consideration that, yes, there are things we as leaders can do, but there are things that also as an organization, we need to encourage and provide proposals and justifications, and then we will see the kind of change we want. Thank you. Thank you, um, Zifa. I want actually, because it's um, Theodora who... Um, and made the point, and it's like she's not satisfied with what's been done, um, and and so I'll go to the Dr. Theodora. Do you think women are doing enough, particularly about SDG uh, um, uh, um, projections and expectations? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dio. And uh, what I think I'll give I you one two minutes. Okay. Right. Thank you. And what I want to say is that there is a lot that needs to be done. And Jifa and Odilia have shed light on that. I know of um, one lady who had to leave, uh, actually had to venture into her own business because she got pregnant and went on maternity leave, comes back, and then her job, her, you know, her schedule had been taken over or her beat had been taken over by somebody and there was nothing, practically nothing for her to do. This is something that persists, you know, in, in newsrooms. And I believe that one, and when um, I, I saw a comment about, you know, deliberate policies at the gov uh, national levels and so on, I'm just th thinking that even um, journalism associations, they, they have, you know, the, obligation or the mandate sort of to ensure that women thrive better in this space. So it is important that when, especially we women, when we find ourselves on those, you know, as executives of, of those associations and men who are gender sensitive have to also ensure that all news organizations have a gender focus or they are very, they are gender sensitive. It's very, very important. And I also believe that yes, uh, women leaders in news organizations have a critical role to play because recently, I think two, three weeks ago, I had one particular um, journalist in Ghana who is well known talk about the fact that um, a lot of the time when we met or when even generally like interns, for instance, they go into newsrooms in certain news organizations, there are some things that they, they don't even do or even on the job training, they practically don't get any on, on, on the job training. They are rather, they rather become errand, you know, people. And I believe that if, and this particular journalist was actually saying that I don't want, you know, those who are coming after me to suffer the same, you know, the, the, the same sufferings, you know, that I suffered. I need to ensure that even though I had to go through, you know, all that mail to be able to get to where I am, I want them, their journey to be shorter. And that is sustainable journalism, ensuring that future generations do not suffer you know, all the, the brands that, you know, whatever that we suffered, we don't want them to. And so it is very important that any woman anywhere, even in the classroom ensures that, you know, women are encouraged to thrive better when they, 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 they find themselves in this career. Thank you. Dayo, if I may come in because I need to exit uh, for another meeting. At the end of the day, we must think of it as a business. And women must also acquire the skills that contribute value to the business. There are, there are inadequate training programs, I must admit, for women. And, I'll, and to be honest, I even dislike some of the training programs. It's only about maybe gender reporting, disability reporting. Why? 
We also want to report politics. I've covered elections in Ghana since 2000, and 2000 to 2016. I couldn't have done that if I hadn't gone on deliberate political reporting courses with Reuters or done work with uh, Commonwealth Broadcasting and the like. Even then, most of those courses are capped at age, what, 30 or 35. Very, very unfair. So if you're a woman like me at this age, age 45, you won't get any tra training programs. You will not get fellowships. It's very, very disappointing. So what is the point? So I think the training programs, the scope of them must expand and allow women to venture into areas that probably they wouldn't have to have without the requisite training. Because if you want to cover politics, you want to cover security and conflict, you want to cover those difficult areas. It means you need the training. And a lot of the time, those trainings are not available for women. Even when they are, it's at the benevolence of an individual. Sometimes you have to go and lobby. And so I think women also need to be crafty and get into spaces where they feel they may not be wanted. For somebody like me, I'm a very forceful character. And I find that a lot of people are held back by what they think are perceptions instead of trying to break barriers and not seeing these barriers. And I think that's where women face major challenges. I just wanna quickly add on to something Theodora said about the experts. We do want women experts, but Theodora, we women as women, we need to have a serious conversation amongst ourselves. We need to be honest. Our women experts and you know, academics and professionals are unwilling to do the media rounds. They always use the excuse that you've called me at too short a notice. You've called. If you know that you're an expert in something and it's COVID, definitely there will be short notice calls. If these issues matter to you, you must make it matter to others. I, as one of the few female journalists, I'm sure Odilia will attest to that. We get exhausted, I'll be honest, being called to participate in one panel or the other, or give speaking or do speaking engagement. Because when people ask us, we see this not just for ourselves, but as a public duty to encourage others, maybe younger like us. But it's very exhausting. Our women professionals and experts are not helpful. And the truth is our turnaround time for production is very You call them on Wednesday, they'll say, okay, call me on Friday to confirm. And then on Friday, they totally disappoint you. You are scrambling to put your program together. You don't want to do that. So unless you know the person is reliable, you won't. So the women must have an honest conversation with themselves. Men, like I said, like to peddle influence. They like to take advantage of opportunities that typically will not get. And so I've been a female journalist. I was away for four years. I came back earlier this year in March. If I tell you all the people who've called me, telling me they want to be on my program, you'll be surprised. No woman has called me, not a single one. Wow. But all these men that had cultivated over 20 years, as soon as I came back, they reached out. Jifa, welcome back. How are you? I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk. It's because they want airtime. It's because they want to be out there. Women need to wake up. Otherwise, no one will give you. And that's where I'd like to end. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Difa, for the frank talk. Um, we have to go to Adelia now, but I, I have one pressing observation. Mona Magdi, say, Magdi says, all, also, some newsrooms do not prefer to hire women because after they are well-trained, they can easily leave them due to family issues. They invest in them, but at the end of the day, the decision is not for the women. How we can guarantee to the media outlet that women will not leave after they train um, them due to family issues. Well, that's true. And I think we addressed uh, um, and that, that that's a reality that um, um, some women have to face because they have other things apart from profession, they have family, they have other interests and so on, maybe even business. And I don't think it's limited to women, men too. Get, my newsroom has become a training ground and in three months, they are gone. Three months, we have trained interns and they are gone. So it, I think it's a general thing. 
Um, Odelia, let's come to you. I wonder if we can extend our time, if the organizers will not um, 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 shoot us, if we extend the time, because we started late. And so I wonder if we can go beyond quarter past the hour um, okay, so and take another I, Okay, minutes. hello, Mr. Dio. Yes, John. Okay, so hello, Mr. Dio. All right, so um, yes, we can, can extend the time a little bit because luckily we have speed networking after this session, so not another panel session. So maybe those who might want okay, to go great. for speed networking might go, go, go yeah. But please, let's, let's, let's just Thank 15 you minutes. Much. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that you won't wiggle my neck if we extend the time. So Odelia, I'll come to you. Um, so let's have your presentation, which I am excited about. It's a specialty of mine talking about media sustainability. Hello. I run a nonprofit media organization. Yes. If, if you have it, just share it for me. Okay. I share it with you, um, so if you have it, just share it. Yeah, I do. I do have all your presentations. So just a second and I'll be sharing Odelia's um, presentation. And I was saying that I find it interesting because, just a second, yes, that's it. Um, because um, in today's world where, like um, Lars said, we are battling with um, the reality of um, economic downturn in our industry, dwindling resources, adverts, and so on. Newspapers are not selling. Um, we're scrambling to look for sustainable means of uh, uh, um, um, keeping our, our newspapers, our radio stations, and TV stations afloat. So this is particularly interesting to me. Um, can you see, um, I'm sharing Odelia's um, screen. I'm sorry, presentation now. Can you see it? Yes, I can see. Okay, great. So, yeah, well, could you put it in a slideshow so that you're ready? Is this fine? Yeah, this is fine. Okay, so um, once we okay. are talking about sustainability, um, I would want us to take it from three perspectives. Um, the fact that we have good content that will generate the necessary um, revenues, and then that will engage our communities um, in the way that will continuously provide the one, the numbers in terms of audience share, and then two, in terms of the community that will come and do um, the spending with us. And so um, basically, these are the three perspectives that I'd like to have the conversation on. The next slide, please. Yes, so <clears throat> when we say we're looking at the pillars of, for um, sustainability um, for any media house, we want to really take a look at the economy. Um, we want to take a look at the politics um, in, within which that media um, company organization exists, the content that they have. And remember also that technology is becoming a big thing. And so if you are... Uh, currently working with the media house and you do not have the technological systems to really run your business, then you're in big trouble. Then we also have the community. Community is critical. Community could be the spending community. Um, community could be the audience community. Um, community could be <clears throat> the various audience um, that we create with various programs that um, we're looking at. The next slide, please. Dio, are you there? Okay, so with the economic side, um, what we have been doing here 
um, within the multimedia group is to always take things from two perspectives, um, either looking at our social projects, which generally could, or educational programs, which in the long run could actually become great um, revenue drivers, um, which also connects to sustainable conversations relating to either poverty, the environment, um, energy, um, technology, um, gender. Um, so all of this social projects, these social projects and education, um, remember that if you do the content very well, it will generate um, revenue for you in the long run. Then we have, of course, revenue drivers, um, which um, with events, which we know that we're generally doing these ones for um, money. So in these times, we can actually look for some non-media products, which um, could actually also be um, revenue generating for us. For example, there are some um, research that media houses could get into. And this, if the media house is known as a space for generating a certain um, data. So for example, Bloomberg has serious data they generate and people actually go um, to purchase um, those packages from Bloomberg, um, not necessarily as media information, but as data that could actually become like means by which the media house can um, raise revenue. Um, once the media house has the outlets to popularize whatever they are doing, it becomes easier for that media house to actually look at this as um, real revenue generating um, sources. So if you have new data that you have come up with, people doing market entry, companies coming from different parts of the world to enter into your markets could actually use you as a good source. I'm actually looking for the opportunity where you, we, we, we as big media houses in Africa can actually take the bull by the horn and develop some big data that people can use in Africa. Because when it comes to African data, sometimes it's a bit checkered and not really so available. And then of course, we also need to give um, our clients more value than they required. And so we have to be able to think about other sources by which um, we can give value. So for example, when people come here to pay for airtime to do radio or TV programs, when they are done, we decide to pick the data from it and then do infographics and share on social media for them. And sometimes those ones have even given the clients more value and ha has actually given them quick response to issues even more than um, they used the traditional uh, media sources. And then um, our various teams um, should be trained and should be um, told that in as much as you're generating um, um, content, you are actually out there to also sell the organization. Once everybody knows that when they step out there, they are not just journalists, but they are also out there. Whatever content they are even building is probably uh, going to be a good marketing tool for the company. That is a big deal. And it, it gradually, media organizations will have to let every member of their team from reception even up onto the reporters know that they are actually out there to sell the organization. The next slide, please. Yes, so um, when it comes to the political aspect, media houses, um, and I think it's all over the world, um, issues relating to the ownership is, is a big deal. And the less political the ownership is, the better, because then that doesn't really give the media house a lot of um, coloration. And it also doesn't give um, the media house a lot of, um, negative investments, you know, so if you have various um, companies who want to do business with that organization, um, the ownership should be structured in such a way that people in Ghana, we have NDC and MPP, so if the station is for an NDC station, and for example, they are in government, it means that people who are spending uh, with this particular um, organization 
um, want to be very careful. They are not actually giving a political coloration because they spent with this particular um, media house. And so the ownership has to be really, 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 really um, checked. Then, of course, during political eras, that also affects and influences even the budgets and how government does its spending. You definitely know that um, during elections, if you're not um, with the certain government or you are known to be um, an opposition person, it definitely will affect your advertising and budgeting. I'm not saying that um, people in politics should not uh, own media houses, but I'm saying that if we can keep the ownership out of the business and make it known that this is a business and not politics, then it does not, politics will not um, in the long run affect even the sort of editorial um, that is done, um, the, even the advertising that comes into the business, all of that can be affected because the ownership is clearly seen as either political or um, skewed or tilted in, in an area that is not really palatable to everybody. The next slide. Yes, content. My observation is that a lot of the media houses um, have generated content based on um, day sitting and assuming that um, this is what the people want. So let's just put this content together. There has to be a clear strategy, um, yearly strategy, messaging. How do you want to send the message to the public? Um, but this has to be based on data. So for example, in here, what we currently um, do or some programs that we've currently come up with is based on GDP data, is based on um, generally people requesting um, for particular content or we connecting with a certain community and thinking that this community is totally out of the various things we do. For example, we have a program called Foreign Affairs and um, this is based on the fact that we saw there wasn't any solid content for the diplomatic community. Now, once we enter into the diplomatic community, maybe through ambassadors that we interview for this program, we get to also do a presentation on what we're doing at the multimedia group, how this um, um, embassy can connect with um, the, the, the various programs that we're doing. You notice that some embassies have a lot of um, interest in environmental issues, entertainment issues, gender related issues. So once you find that these media, um, this embassies find their interest and then you sort of tailor things that will suit them. It's all based on research. You cannot just assume that this is what the public wants. And so let me just um, give a general information. Then a general lack of audience um, um, knowledge about the audience is critical. No, so what the audience that consistently watch the, 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 the content you're producing from morning to evening, what are their interests? So for example, I know that the multimedia audience currently that we have um, is between 35 upwards. Um, if you're looking for middle to upper class Ghanaians, that's what um, you find within this hour um, that watch us or listen to us at the multimedia group. Once we have this kind of research, we know that there's a certain kind of content that we cannot produce for these people. There's a certain kind of language that we cannot, people will not forgive us if we actually said certain things. If we spoke, if we mixed English with the local languages during an English show, we know that they will not forgive us for it. But for other media houses that maybe have a certain audience um, below 35 going down, may not necessarily have all the big revenues to spend, um, will not mind if the morning show host speaks Akan or local language and mixes it with English. So you need to know your audience dynamics and then you sort of do your programming to suit um, um, the audience that you're looking at. And then, a lot of us don't do a lot of online um, 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 content, 
content specifically for online and then also content that you are actually doing that you know that it will give your traditional media also some level of visibility. The next slide. Sorry, just, just to say that you need to round off in a minute or two. We have run out of time now. Okay, so I um, mean, we should do some training for our teams in relation to um, technology. Um, we should take a look at um, the continental free trade is a place that we can really plug in and um, really make a lot of revenue. So um, there are so many um, after offices in almost every country. If you, you are in Nigeria, make sure you have a meeting with your after office, take a look at their national strategy, develop content um, in that um, perspective. That would be basically um, take a look at the various payment systems alone can even be a whole content that you can generate. The next slide, please. Yes, we do a lot of community related um, 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 programs and based on that, we have generated different uh, sources of community. So for example, we have a program called the National Mass and Science Place. And you notice that everybody that has been to a secondary school before uh, definitely has created their own community. And so once this program comes on, you see people who have gone to Preset, who have gone to Every Girls, who have gone to, and these are all different kinds of communities, but they come together um, to form the National Science and Mass community. And once this program is there, you know that you will get a lot of people coming in with various adverts um, to come and play within this time. So you need to be able to create a lot of communities based on different programs based on different people's interests. And then these communities become actually like ways of generating um, revenue. We created the um, um, SMB community through a program called the Business Fund. And it's become like so much talked about as a content. And it's basically to help SMEs to come up to, to, to help create sustainable jobs um, connecting to the SDGs. Based on this one, it was supposed to be a simple contribution to the business community um, so that startups, SMEs can actually have um, means of sharing uh, whatever things that they are doing in their various businesses. Now it has created for us so much revenue. What actually one of our biggest revenue drivers, having about four to um, three to four big um, companies seated on it. It started off just as a social project, but now it's creating for us a lot of revenue. And so if it's a company that is big and is looking at um, social projects, contributing to social projects, yes, this is one of the means by which you can do that. I know that when it's a small media house, you have been thinking about how to turn your finances around and that becomes a bit of a difficulty. But if you can and do some small, um, simple projects that is social, it will gradually generate some good, um, revenue for you. The last slide, please. Yes. I always put this slide in my, my, my presentations because I feel that if people do not have teams that are energized and people do not have teams that actually connect to the vision and dream of um, whatever you are doing, it actually um, will tell on the kind of outputs that um, you will put out there. And you can tell that we gradually have some um, female um, dominance within our team, just making sure that we produce the kind, the best content, um, and then we are actually also contributing our quota to the sustainable development goals. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Odelia, for your presentation. Very enlightening. And um, that's the good thing about attending conferences. Even me, I've 
learned a few things. Uh, for example, even with, before looking out um, to expand your financial base, looking at other models you can adopt, what about the content you already have? You know, um, promoting your content, um, doing research for you to be able to understand more your audiences and so that you can actually tailor content um, to demands um, of your audiences. Thank you very much. Um, but I wonder, so from my example, I wonder where in looking for um, more ways of sustainability, sustaining our organizations financially, where, how, how do we protect editorial independence? Because in Nigeria, for example, you know, more and more, and in many places, not just in Africa, all over the world, we are increasingly depending on donor funding for critical reporting. We are increasingly depending on government. You know, we have to be creative. We're not just offering adverts. In some newspapers in Nigeria, online, traditional, they are actually offering service such that government um, uh, um, spokespersons send press releases and we have created aspects of our website where you can uh, pay for press releases, paid content and so on. So where, where, how do we protect our editorial independent, independence in all this, Odelia? So at, at the multimedia group, I think the messaging, um, and because we are storytellers, we need to let people know what we stand for. So even though we actually are um, a very commercial um, company, um, we have paid for content like you talk about, people know that multimedia stands for integrity, um, that whatever things that are out there, we will speak the truth. And so they definitely know that even if they are paying us for a certain content, we will not compromise on these um, um, big words that have been put out there in relation to integrity. We will not compromise on that. Um, if it is A, we will say that it is A. Um, even when you come for orientation within our company, um, the CEO will tell you that even if his mother does something that is wrong um, and he sends you out there, report on what his mother has done, come and put it on the TV or put it on the radio. And when you are done, he will go and talk about his family matters. And so you notice that from day one of orientation to finish, you're, it's put into your head that it's about integrity, putting people and um, putting the information out there as it is. Once you are able to put this message across as a business, you notice that anybody that is coming to you knows that you stand for X and Y. And therefore, even if they are coming to put compromising content on your media um, outlet, they know that it is not possible because they might, you might, they, they might want to compromise you, which you do not stand for that sort of compromise. Thank you very much. I wonder if, Theodore, you want, you want to say something? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dio, for the yes, opportunity. Yes, go ahead. And yeah, I think the question you asked about um, independence, um, editorial independence is very, very critical because when we did the sustainable journalism in Sub-Saharan African report, one of the things that our uh, respondents told us was that the one of the main things that can mitigate a, against um, Sustain, the practice of sustainable journalism in Saharan Africa is, you know, influence political influence, and so this this is real. And I think that the response Odilia gives to uh, tells us that this is a, a position that a particular media organization takes that we will still remain independent no matter you know who gives us revenue, and it is a matter of new other news organizations also maybe taking that stance but a lot of the time we see that that influence persists in in sub-saharan africa and it is something that and that is why we recommended that we have to find other models other more sustainable models so i'm just and odelia gives us those other models but i just want to find out from odelia about um 
the subscription or sorry, yeah. Sorry, um, sorry, sorry, Theodora. That will be the last question because okay. I'm told we have to end the session and move to another. But you can ask the question and please, in just a few seconds, Odelia, answer the question. I will wrap up. Thank Okay, so subscription is one way of generating revenue where, uh, especially on online media, for instance, people pay before accessing the news. I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't think it's very, you know, prominent in our part of the world, especially in Ghana. It is not something that we knew about that. And then the tech giants, you know, that is also a discussion where Australia ha has been able to get tech gi giants to, you know, give them uh, tax rebates, tax, you know, pay for um, their use of their platforms to access news. What are your reflections on, on these two? Can Africa do something like that? Yeah. Yes, I think we can get there one day, but um, if we need to solve our internet problems um, as one of the key, the infrastructure. So once the infrastructure is there, you would notice that gradually um, we will be moving towards that side. Remember that we still are very heavy on traditional media. And so people think that, hey, they can get this on traditional media. And then of course, when you get to various locations, people are pulling out their phones and sending things on social media. They have enough have news on social media that they are consuming. Remember also that when it comes to some of the news content, you notice that a lot of media houses are also doing live streaming um, on, on, on social media, which is also going for free. And so, like I said earlier, if we want to be able to um, do subscription as content that people would really go for, then we should be taking a look at the, the, the Bloomberg panel. Um, they have like a big platform which contains a lot of investment information. So once people, investors know that when they get here, they can get so much information in relation to what to do when they want to invest in Ghana. Um, once they have all of those detailed information, that people will be willing to pay for. But if it is daily news that is happening around, if, if we decide at multimedia to say people should pay for that kind of content, they will get it for free sitting somewhere else. And so it's not Thank really so much. Thank you very much, um, my distinguished panelists. I hope we have dealt judiciously with this topic. Unfortunately, there's so much more to talk about, um, different models. I'm sure there are people in the house who um, want to learn much more about, you know, sustainability, financial sustainability, um, but we do have to go. I want to thank our panelists. Um, and I